Welcome to episode 34 of the Hot Esquina podcast. Yo soy tu anfitrión Enrique, joined by my co-host Alex. Today we got a special episode for you as we have a very special guest that we're going to welcome on in a little bit. Y'all might know him. And we'll be right back. <laughs> It is high. It is far. It is gone. Ahí va por el desfile. Olvida la sabor a calle en la en la calle. Esa se va, se va, se fue. And we're back. So, without further ado, um, I'm gonna welcome on my co-host Alex first, and then uh, we'll let y'all know who we got on with us. Uh, Alex, how you doing? Pretty good, man. Pretty good. Uh, excited to interview this prestigious guest that you were able to get for us. Yes, sir. So let's not keep them waiting. Without any further ado, I'd like to welcome on somebody that everybody in Yankees Twitter should be familiar with. Y'all might know him from back in the day when he was in the MLB fan cave. Y'all might know him from his previous work in podcasts. Or if you know, you're just getting to know him on WFAN at night, you definitely know him as well because he does great stuff for the fan. I'm talking, of course, about Keith McPherson. Keith, welcome to the podcast, man. Thank you for coming on with us. Hey, good morning, fellas. Thanks for having me. Long time coming. And uh, glad to be here talking Yank soon with you guys or whatever you guys want to get into offseason stuff. Uh, just glad we were able to find a time to make this happen. And uh, glad to be able to give you guys some time on this Monday morning. Thank you, man. Thank you. And and by the way, I'd be remiss. I, I know I mentioned all the work you do, but I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention the great job you do with uh, Sweeney Murdy on your own podcast, BXB. I have yeah. to give that a shout out, man. Uh, For anybody that doesn't listen, definitely give that a download, a, a subscription. You know what I'm saying? they Keith and uh Sweeney do great work. Definitely give that a listen as well, you know? Yeah, BXB has been great. We started it kind of late in the season, but uh, it was, you know, Sweeney Murdy, who does the Yankees post game, coming together with me, who usually comes on right after Sweeney Murdy's post game and talks to the fans on WFAN till two in the morning. So it's, you know, familiar voices for uh, people that listen to Yankees baseball on the radio. And we're just two guys that are in the Yankee universe with like different approaches and different takes. You know, Sweeney is a reporter. He's very measured. He's pretty much down the middle, even keeled. And I'm a fan turned analyst, self-proclaimed fanalist. Like I'm coming in with the fans view. I'm coming in with the fans take. Uh, and I don't have to pretend to be a reporter. I don't write any articles. So uh, together we make a pretty decent podcast. And uh, now I'm back in the podcast game. And uh, when I met you, Enrique, I think it was spring training, so it was March of last year. Mm -hmm. No, March of this year, early 2022, and uh, I listened to your podcast. I think I was driving from Tampa to Orlando, and I listened to an episode of your podcast, and I told you once I got back into my own podcast, I'd come on yours. So now is the time. Now is the day. We definitely appreciate it, man. And thank you for listening. And and you were great uh, in spring training, man. You're definitely a cool dude to hang with. You're a man of the people. Um, I think that's why you've been so successful and all the good things have come your way. You know, good things come to good people. You know, you you're doing your thing. You you started out like us. Now you're you're on TV, you know, on MLB Network. You do your thing on the fan. Nothing, nothing but good things for you, man. And you deserve it, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm blessed, bro. It's a product of the work. It's a product of the grind. It's a product of just, you know, going for something and putting the right energy out. And like you said, uh, being good to people, being a good person um, in the spring training, you know, that I think when I met you at spring training, I just came down from being with John and Susan on the call. And uh, I, I mean, I'm used to being out there at spring training with the fans. I'm used to being out there kind of mixing it up. So yeah, it was cool, man. It was cool to run into you there. And we kind of had already known each other from Yankees Twitter. And when I meet someone in real life, uh, like you said, I'm a man of my word. If I tell you in real life, hey, I'll listen to your podcast. Hey, I'll come on your podcast. That's exactly what I'm going to do. And we did. So appreciate you, man. Uh, 
Alex, hopefully you get the the pleasure of meeting Keith one day in spring training. Uh, like he said, uh, we got to vibe a little bit. My son Elijah got to vibe with him. Keith Alex is also a fellow dad, so maybe you know you'll get to run into him in spring training with his kids at some point and vibe with them. You know that'd be a cool thing. Yeah, yeah, it was cool to meet your son. Uh, one day when I have a son, I, I want to bring him up as a Yankees fan, show him the way, bring him to games, and uh, yeah, it was cool to meet your son, and maybe I'll, I'll meet Alex and his son too. Yeah, man, uh, it's one of those. It's, that's how I grew up a Yankee fan. It was my dad, so. You know, I'm planning to do the same thing with my boy, um, but yeah, man, it's uh, it's it's good to meet you. It's uh, it's it's one of those, it's one of those things where you're, you're we're actually you know, getting this thing going, putting a putting a good vibe out there, and honestly, you've m you mesh with that vibe, so I'm glad to have you on today, man. Without any further ado, man, let's let's get started. Keith, first of all, man, let's uh, <laughs> let's get the bad out of the way first. Um, what's what's your thoughts on uh? the Yankees season and coming up short yet again. And, uh, you know, their issues um overcoming Houston, you know what I'm saying? It seems like they're, we said it on a previous episode of the podcast. They seem to be our kryptonite. What's your, your thoughts on this past season? Yeah, I, I guess we can start with Houston first. I feel like the Astros are just in another weight class than the Yankees, right? And the Yankees couldn't really beat them in the regular season. They got a couple games games off them um couldn't beat them in Houston at all in the regular season and then you get to the postseason the Yankees take five games to defeat the Guardians so they have to roll right into Houston and they were swept by the Astros well for fans getting swept sucks it's the worst way you can you know end a season right you played in a series you didn't get one win but the New York Yankees will tell you we're one of the last four teams we made it to the American League Championship Series. We won 99 games. We won the AL East. We're close. We're getting there. And close is not good enough for the New York Yankees, the 27-time champions, the New York Yankees who preach World Series. And right now they're in one of their longer droughts from appearing in a World Series. It's been 13 years. And what they'll tell you is the league has closed the gap on us. And we have metrics to tell you that IKF is a good shortstop. Josh Donaldson is under contract. He had a great year defensively. We just think he came in late and has to work out some kinks and some things at the plate, but he's our third baseman. Like they, They're going to piss on your leg and tell you it's raining as much as they can. You know it's not raining. You know this doesn't feel right. You know something's going on here. And we all kind of knew that going into the season because that IKF Donaldson trade, something was fishy about it. We were all kind of like, wait, all this to get Gary out of here? What about Geo? We love Geo. Josh Donaldson's 36. IKF got traded twice in that offseason. He's the guy you want to play shortstop. And when it all kind of fails, and I know it's not all on them, it's on pitching, it's on, uh, I don't know, 50 strikeouts in the series. They had, you know, one game where they all struck out multiple times. It just was a mess. And when it comes, like, when it when it all unravels and it comes down to, like, the biggest stage and you don't have it, it, it's the worst feeling. It's like you're getting exposed. So you would hope that the Yankees look in the mirror and say, we need to make some drastic changes, but they won't make drastic changes. They'll make a little bit of tweaks, a little bit of changes, see what they can do. And, you know, if they end up landing Aaron Judge, which I hope they do, I just expect them to say that's how much we have to spend out here, right? We can't really go for it and go get the Carlos Rodons or the Trey Turners or whoever's out there on the market. I just I just think they're going to settle, and I think they're going to, you know, keep going through the same motions. Cashman back, Boone back. Maybe they get judged, maybe they don't. But they're always going to have something to tell the fan base which to them isn't an excuse, but a reason for why they came up short. So I don't know. I've been doing this for a long time. You guys are probably in your 30s around my age. You guys saw the glory days. You guys saw the dynasty. You saw the caliber and the expectations that Derek Jeter and Mariano Rivera and Bernie Williams and Andy Pettit and Jorge Posada and those guys, Paul O'Neill. you know, you could list the guys up and down that were on those championship teams. It's just 
It's not the same anymore. It doesn't look like that anymore for the New York Yankees. You always hear people mention George Steinbrenner. Let the boss rest in peace. It's been a long time. Hal is not George Steinbrenner, but he knows what to do to put this team back up top, right? They've got to knock off one team, the Houston Astros, and you got to be able to spend a little bit. You got to go out there and use your superpower. Your superpower is you have the most fans, you make the most money, so you should be spending the most money in a league where you're allowed to go out and spend the most money to field the best team. But do we do we know if they're going to do that? We don't think they're going to do that based off of, you know, how many guys they've passed on. You you see Manny Machado shine in the postseason in 2022. You see Bryce Harper shine in the postseason in 2022. And you think about the uh, 2019 offseason and them passing on those guys and the guys that they did decide to pay, like Giancarlo Stanton and Garrett Cole. Those aren't the guys that have gotten us over the hump, haven't gotten us back to the championship. So I think the big question after this season, and for me as a fan and you guys as podcasters, people that talk about the Yankees cover the Yankees, the big question is, what are they going to do to get over the hump and get back to the World Series? The hump is the Houston Astros. What are they going to do to beat the Houston Astros? And are they willing to actually do what it takes? I, I don't know. We shall see. And that's why we wait. And it's a long winter. And the stove eventually gets hot. You got the GM meetings that just happened, the winter meetings coming up. We just sit back and wait for any type of breaking news we can get and keep our fingers crossed that the Yankees do something that shows, oh, they're going for it. Oh, they mean business. Oh, they're all in this offseason going into next year. It's going to take a lot for us to, as fans, to to have faith in what they're doing. Because like you said, that, that trade was weird. The IKF and Donaldson for Gary and Gio. I mean, we knew Gary had to go out of town. We all, as fans, if you if you just watched the game, you knew he had to be out of here. Just mainly on the defense, just for defense purposes only, he had to be out. And obviously, we after everything that happened, we replaced him with a platinum glover, you know, which is again a coincidence, luck, call it what you will. But that's exactly what happened. It was it was a straight up luck what happened there. I want to ask you something because it's it's more along the lines of of we know there's certain players that cannot be on this roster next year. And if they are on the roster, I think you're going to really demoralize the fan base to a degree. Not that we're going to go anywhere. We're still going to, like you said, they're going to piss on our leg and tell us it's rain because that's just how we are, that that we're fans. But, you know, there has to be certain players that just can't be on this roster. You know, Aaron Hicks probably being one of them. And in my opinion, maybe Glaber Torres has to be one of them. I just don't think he's that, that will see that is a potential move, critical move for this team to actually move forward and be a – more viable offense. Yeah, I'm right there with you, starting with Aaron Hicks. Honestly, didn't think we'd even see Aaron Hicks in the postseason at all, and of course we did. Obviously, there's inju injuries, and that's another built-in excuse for the Yankees. Well, Benintendi got hurt. Well, DJ was hurt back-to-back -back years when we needed him in the postseason. Well, Michael King went down, and Scott Efros went down, and then we lost Ron Marinaccio. There's a bunch of built-in excuses, but let's start with guys that were healthy and guys that were just zeros and came up small. Aaron Hicks. Aaron Hicks maybe had a stretch of a month, maybe a month and a half where he kind of fooled us, kind of made us think, oh, okay, he can hit a little bit. Okay, he can get on base a little bit. He's not bad defensively. No, I, I really feel like after that Derek Jeter night game, Yankees versus Tampa, Frankie Montas on the mound where he was in left field and he dropped a couple balls, one that he hit and failed uh, fair territory and just failed to like play it like it was live. Like the fans were chanting, we want Gallo in that section. I was horrified. I'm like, this guy can't play. They pulled him. And I honestly thought that was all you'd see of him. But, you know, it, just because he's under contract doesn't mean that he needs to play for the New York Yankees. The Yankees can eat that contract 70 million for 70 or 70 million for seven years, something like that. 10, 10 million a year for Aaron Hicks to see him go is worth the 10 million. He's cooked. He doesn't have it anymore. And if he does have it, let him go do what he asked to do. Right. He said, if I was playing for another team every day, it'd be easier. Right. I know that if I'm playing every day for another team, I can help another team win. Please grant him that wish. Please grant him that wish. <laughs> 
we've seen them fumble the rock with these guys so much. Miguel Andujar, what did they get for him? They didn't get anything. He, he ended up being DFA'd so that they could see if Zach Britton was able to pitch at the major league level. He was not. So you basically released Miguel Andujar to make a roster spot for a guy that didn't have it. So now you end up losing two guys. Clint Frazier, that was a guy that was supposed to be a part of the Yankees' future, a top prospect. They get nothing for him. They end up releasing these guys like Tyler Wade and Andrew Velasquez and Ruggie Odor and, you know, um, Greg Allen, guys from two years ago that helped the team. They get rid of those guys. What, what's taking so long to figure out where to trade Glaber Torres? I feel like every deadline, there's conversation around trading Glaber. This, this past deadline, it was supposedly Glaber Torres and Oswald Peraza for Miggy Rojas and Pablo Lopez from the Florida Marlins, the Miami Marlins. I would have loved that deal. Why? Because it would have gave us a starter in Pablo Lopez, who started off the season as an ace, but then he kind of tailed off. But you never know when he could find it again. And with a Matt Blake, maybe he found his ace stuff again. And then Miggy Rojas at shortstop. Imagine us having him in the postseason where you put him there every day and you don't have to go IKF, <laughs> then go Cabrera, then go Peraza, right? That, And then, I don't know, you would have figured out who would have played second base. I know DJ was hurt, but they would have been able to figure that out. Um, I just look at the Yankees like this. They got to make some tough decisions. It wasn't a tough decision to move on from Gary. Everyone knew he was done. I, I always say when Gary missed that tag in the Subway Series that gave up that first run, where I forget who it was, um, slid underneath him. I'm like, oh, he's done. He's cooked here. He's never going to be able to play here after this year. But they were so hard-pressed on trading him, getting some value for him, and they make a trade with Minnesota that allows Minnesota to bring in Carlos Correa <laughs> on a contract that the Yankees should have signed Carlos Correa for. Maybe Boris Company, Boris Corp wasn't going to do that with the Yankees, but we don't know. They bring in Josh Donaldson's money. That clears up money for them to sign Carlos Correa. Josh Donaldson is the guy that called out your $324 million ace. What are we doing here? So here we are in another offseason. They absolutely got to get rid of Aaron Hicks. I don't care if they get anything for him. They got to be looking around for a trade partner with Glaber Torres because Glaber's young and he's still under control. And I feel like his best days as a Yankee, like, they don't exist anymore. He had a good run when uh, when Judge was chasing 61 and 62, right? It was like all the attention wasn't on Glaber. I remember being at a game where he hit a home run in the top of the eighth and the bottom of the eighth. <laughs> Obviously, he was only up on the bottom of the eighth, but they batted around. So he was able to bat twice in the inning, hit two home runs. Where was that in October? Um, I feel like it's Hicks, it's Glaber. Donaldson, IKF, those are like the the order of like, you got to get these guys out of here. You got to figure something else out. But I think they love Glaber Torres. And I don't really expect him to go anywhere because they're going to have too high of a price for him via trade. But as fans, right, those are four guys we're looking at like, all right, we can we got to do something else. We can figure out anything else. But having these guys go out there and commit errors or not hustle or, you know, just strike out and look confused or look lost up there. God willing, they, they make the right moves, Keith. Um, I want to transition now to um, a question that you're probably going to get asked a lot this off season on MLB Network, I'm sure. And that's the elephant in the room about the Aaron we all want to know about. And, of course, we're talking about Aaron Hicks right now. I'm just playing. Of course, we're talking about Aaron Judge. <laughs> um. What do you think um, of his, you know, ongoing free agency? And do you think he'll come back to the Bronx? Or do you think he'll sign with the Giants or elsewhere? What do you think of this whole Aaron Judge situation? I think that the Yankees already have one strike with Aaron Judge as far as negotiating his future deal. And that strike came on opening day when they put out the information that they offered him a $213 million extension on top of the $17 million he already was making. He didn't accept that extension. 
and they kind of threw him under the bus on opening day. I, I've talked about this a bunch on podcasts, on the radio. I'll never forget driving to Yankee Stadium, and I'm late. I'm getting there, and it's like maybe 90 minutes to the game, and they put Aaron Judge on. The media met with Aaron Judge, and I'm like, why is the media meeting with Aaron Judge? They're like, oh, the details of his contract extension have been released. I'm like, oh, did he sign? Did they actually meet? Uh, before the, his deadline and signed Judge. Awesome. This this is great. No, he didn't sign, and they made his information public. And I feel like that's just like in bad faith, negotiating in bad faith. So that was a strike with Judge. Judge was on MLB Network getting the Hank Aaron Award last week, and he said, you know, those first couple games, he's in the outfield thinking, man, did I make a mistake? Should I have taken that money? That's a lot of money to turn down. This is a long season. And I was in those first few games where you could hear fans yelling at Judge, like, why didn't you take the money? Why didn't you sign the contract? Judge, are you crazy? Judge, do you not want to be here? Do you not want to be a Yankee? And then Judge struggled in the beginning of last year. I think he won his first 13 games uh, without a homer. And and Judge is king of hitting the home run. So people are like, what's wrong with this guy? What's going Like, he, I know he heard the noise. But then he put it all together and had his best season season ever and one of the best seasons any of us have ever seen not just as a Yankee but offensively one of the best seasons you've seen as a baseball fan so now he hits free agency the Yankees already messed up in negotiations with the number that they gave him and how they released it to the public so now they have to do the opposite now they have to be super quiet Brian Cashman's at the GM meetings they ask him has he spoken with Aaron Judge's camp Shit, you better be speaking to Aaron Judge's camp every day. You better be in touch with them. And he says, no comment. Yeah, because now you're going to keep it private. Now there's some other people that can compete for your guy. The San Francisco Giants, who have been very open and outward with their conversation around Judge. I actually have called in twice to San Francisco radio. They have said that they will not be outbid. They want to bring him home. The guy grew up 90 minutes from... McCovey Cove watching uh, Barry Bonds. I think there is a really good chance that they wine and dine him. They show him what it would be like to be a giant. And that activates some of those young emotions, some of those young feelings that we all have as a kid looking at our favorite player, favorite team. Aaron Judge could actually live the dream of going home and playing for the Giants. But all of that has nothing to do with the number one thing it's going to take. Money. He wants to make the most money he can possibly make. And if the Yankees play around with Aaron Judge and they set a wall or a ceiling for how far they'll go in negotiations, there's a chance where he's not going to go back to them. A report came out that Aaron Judge's camp did not say to the Yankees, we're going to do you a solid. We'll give you the chance to match any offer that the San Francisco Giants give them. So there's a chance that the Yankees have already floated a number out there, or maybe they have it. But Judge is going to have his time in San Francisco where they could say, you know, it's like recruiting trips. I remember when I was getting recruited playing college football, I only took one visit. I should have taken all five. I just was so impressed with the first school that I went to, and I, and I ended up leaving that school. I transferred after three semesters. I was like, Dummy, you should have went and looked. You should have should have taken a look around, see what you know what other places have to offer. He could go to San Francisco. They close him in a room and they say, "Here's the deal, here's the years. You sign it. You sign it now, and you're with us. You walk out of here, deals off the table. Like I don't know, things like that go on in negotiations, and who knows where he'll be with the Yankees when he walks into. Uh, what is it, AT&T ballpark out there? I think they might have changed the name now. I don't think it's AT&T anymore. It's something else. It's all going to come down to money. The Yankees can't play this where they set their amount of years and their amount of dollars for their stupid budget, for their, you know, being fiscally responsible under how. I think I think it's it's irresponsible to be fiscally responsible when you're the Yankees and you have a player like Aaron Judge who you drafted, who you developed, who you helped build his value and worth because he did everything in your pinstripes, in your stadium, in front of your fans. You have the most fans, and they're all Aaron Judge fans. So a quick way to hurt your business, a quick way to upset your fans and the people that give you money, play with that guy and let him go elsewhere, and you'll have a big problem on your hands. So it's fiscally irresponsible to be talking to Aaron Judge 
and thinking about how how you could be financially responsible. You you, you got to pay the guy. He bet on himself. He made himself probably a hundred million dollars more than he would have had signing with you on opening day. That's on you now. That's your fault. You built the judges' chambers for this guy. He sells the most jerseys. Your team right now is trash without Judge. He carried the team. And we saw in October, they were expecting him to carry again. And he had a little bit of a quieter October. And you know what? It is what it is. The guy was chasing the record, 61-62, the final weeks of the season. He didn't have it like we needed him to have it in October. But you're looking to make this guy a captain. You're looking for this guy to lead your young team. Right. When the Volpes of the world do come up and the Jason Dominguez and, you know, these other guys that you have coming up, you want them to look at Aaron Judge with a, a C on his shirt and watch him run out there. And they see how the Yankee way is through Aaron Judge. Everyone talks about Judge's process. Rizzo. Rizzo is another one tied to Judge. I think Rizzo comes back only if Judge comes back. If Judge doesn't come back, he signs a new deal elsewhere. They're best buds. Their wives hang out together. And there's conversation about Samantha Judge, Aaron's wife. I, I see, I've see i seen her and his parents in the Delta Lounge a ton. They choose to watch the game in the, in the Delta Lounge with all the fans, where fans have access to them. They could be in a suite. They could be in a private suite with just their family. They are regular people. And all the conversation around Samantha Judge wanting to go home, I don't think that's true. We just saw her run in the New York City Marathon. She's a New Yorker now. She's been here for years with with Judge, and the Yankees need to present them the key to the city and two gold thrones and show them, hey, you sign with us, you are the king and the queen. We've got skeleton keys to get you in every bar, restaurant, wherever you want to be, wherever you want to go, and this is where you want to finish your career. You don't want to switch in the middle of your career and go out west to San Francisco, even if it's close to where you grew up, where you went to school. Being a New York Yankee carries way more weight. You broke the home run record for the American League wearing a Yankee hat. We want to keep you here. We will outbid the San Francisco Giants. And we have other ways to make the value of being a Yankee uh, even higher, right? There are a ton of brands and companies that advertise with the New York Yankees. Every one of those companies should have an Aaron Judge deal or commercial after this, right? So if it's not just... um, 320 million in eight years on paper, right? That that shows you the dollar amount. There's also endorsements and brand deals coming in where they're swimming in the money. It, it, it should happen like that, but it's now not just up to the Yankees. I even think the Dodgers are going to try and throw in an offer to raise the price on the Giants. Why wouldn't they? That's their in-division rival. Um, and then they always say there's a, a dark horse or a mystery team. Somebody will come up, but that's where we're at right now. And this is going to take a while. Uh, last thing I'll say on it, I said this on air. My mom texts me, and she said, Yankees signed judge. No exclamation point, no period, no question mark. And I look at my phone, and I'm like, hold on, let me check. And then three seconds later, I'm like, I don't need to check this. I know this is going to take a while. There's no way on November 10th that the Yankees signed judge. This thing has to play out over the next couple months. It's not going to get done uh, before the winter meetings. So I told my mom, don't ever text me something like that. <laughs> don't ever text me something like that. I'm like, I'm like, is that a question? Make sure you make sure you put a question mark after that because that came across my phone as an alert. You see the text notification, Yankee sign judge. I'm like, ESPN didn't break this. Let me check. It's just my mom uh, being on Twitter now and not knowing that there's a bunch of troll accounts and even if they have a verified badge, they're not verified. They're not credible anymore. That's not legit. I told my mom, stop reading everything on Twitter. Twitter is not the same place. <laughs> See, I think this is a big turning point when it comes to the Yankees' image, really, when it comes to this offseason. This offseason is going to really let us know how this team is going to go moving forward. I thought they did a piss-poor job at how they handled Peraza when they brought him up. Oh, yeah. That was a very – that was horrible. I mean, it was disrespectful. It was it was just a lot of things. I think I think Peraza has a bad taste in his mouth with the way that this team treated him toward the end of last season. And I think Judge saw that too. And I think, I've told Enrique this, that I think the prestige of having that uniform has dwindled over the last couple of years, especially the way that they handled, like you said, in the beginning of the season with, this, with the extension talk. And we know, we saw the Machado. We saw the Harper thing a couple of off seasons ago. This thing took forever, right? In the brink of spring training is when those guys signed. 
granted, you know, it's a different story with the Yankees. I feel this is just me. There's two. There's twofold. I I agree. Uh, the whole thing with the Giants. I think it's a two horse race. Personally, there's going to be other teams involved because they have to bring up that price. And, and and even if there are other teams involved, his agent will make sure other teams are involved. That's just what they do. So when it comes to that, there's always going to be that pull of going home. You can bring Barry Bonds into the room. You can bring Rich really into the room, which is his favorite player when he was a kid. Bring those guys into the room. They're all going to be there. The money's going to be there. Now, here's my two cents. Going to the West Coast, you lose a lot of eyeballs. We all know that. Otani gets the, the coverage that he does because of what he does. But even Mike Trout has dwindled as far as like the national eyes go because he's in the West Coast. He gets less eyes on him on a, on a day-to-day basis. Same thing with uh, Mookie Betts. Even though Mookie's a fantastic upper echelon player in this league, he doesn't have that star power that he used to have when he was with Boston because the East Coast just brings in more dollars, brings in more eyes. See, I think now Judge's decision is going to be more business-related than it is going to be the pull of the team or the pull of any team. I think the business, the money, like you say, is on the East Coast. The big money is on the East Coast. So I think that's going to be a major factor in this whole thing. But my question to you is, do you really think that the Yankees can afford to wait to let this whole process drag out all the way until January, February, before improving this this team? Because I feel if you're going to go to the table with Judge, you better come with toys. You need to come with a lot of toys. And you need to show that you are improving this team exponentially before you even sit down on the table with him. Because he knows this team is trash without him. I, he knows that, dude. The judge is not stupid. He knows this team is trash without him. So how how can you make the trash go away, make it look prettier, before you even consider signing, before he even considers signing, signing with you? Because I feel they need to make improvements in XYZ position. And if they don't do those improvements in XYZ position, how can you expect him to just run back to you so i my opinion is you have to come to that negotiating table with toys already signed how do you feel about that yeah the the scary part is also that you know it's going to take a while and they may just wait on making other moves because the biggest move financially is judge (laughs) and they can't do that they cannot let other free agents come off the board they cannot sit on the guys that they have without making calls and trades and trying to maneuver and move money because of judge judge cannot be this big fish that holds up every other move this off season. Because if that's the case, you are running it back, you know, and, and they can't run it back. They got to make some, some changes. If you wait on judge and do land judge, I don't know. Uh, they, they have to be actively in the market, actively trying to move some players and sign some players to make this team better around Judge while still having the money to the side for Judge. And I hate I hate when people try and talk about the Yankees like the Yankees are broke. They can do both. You know, they can go out and sign free agents and still have enough money for Aaron Judge. Uh, but will they? I don't know. This modern-day Yankees is different. And like you said, the jersey, the road grays, or the pinstripes, it, it doesn't carry the same weight as it used to because we're further and further away from a world series. We're further and further away from the dominant Yankees, that winning culture. These guys have to reestablish the Yankees. And uh, I don't think they do that without Aaron judge this year. And I also don't think they do that by only signing Aaron judge. You got to go out there and uh, improve around the margins. And uh, you, you can't run it back with that left side of the infield. And you definitely can't run it back with Aaron Hicks as a fourth outfielder. I won't even say a starter in left field. They definitely can't do that. Um, it's interesting, fellas. Baseball offseason is long, but it is interesting. And that's why we have stuff to talk about in baseball all year round. Because uh, we don't know how this is going to go. If it was the MLB free agent frenzy like the NBA has or the trade deadline like the NFL has, it would all happen right away. This is a, a, a ongoing thing for months. you know. And this year we don't have the lockout. So we'll, we'll see how it all, all plays out. But to tell you the honest truth, I don't know. I'm not that confident. I've I've started thinking about what the team is like without Aaron Judge. Maybe they spend that money elsewhere, but no. If they they're they're not going to be out on Judge. So if they miss out on Judge and it's February, other guys are going to be signed and going to come off the board. So it's not like they can miss out on Aaron Judge and spend elsewhere. They need to be doing both somehow, and I don't think that they 
look at it like that. I think they look at it as, hey, we, we sold a ton of chicken buckets. Our tenants was back up. Business is booming. Uh, we don't want to pay that luxury tax. It'll be all questions from me. One's about the Yankees and one's a personal one for you. Um, going back uh, full circle uh, to one of my first questions to you about Houston. Uh, recently, uh, they fired uh, GM James Click. I've heard calls on WFAN, by the way, it's a great show you do on uh, at night, man. But I've heard it like all throughout the day, people talking about, hey, why don't they, you know, fire Cashman and bring in James Click? Like thinking that, oh, my God, it, James <laughs> Click is going to be the savior, not knowing that he's as much as if not more into analytics than Cashman is. It's like you're bringing another Brian Cashman. What are your thoughts about? Or what would you say, rather, to those fans that want Cashman gone and want to bring in James Click? And as far as my personal question to you, I, I mentioned earlier all your accolades, man, how you started off as one of us and, you know, you made your way up, got your, your gig on WFAN, you're on MLB Network daily, you know what I'm saying? Um, what's been your favorite part of that journey? Well, going back to James Click, the first thing I said about Brian Cashman this year, when I would take calls about his contract is up, he can't lead this team. They got to go. They got to go a different direction. They got to get a different voice. <laughs> I said, that's Brian Cashman's job until he doesn't want it. It's not like you and I, when our contract ends for a gig or for some type of work that we're doing. And it's like, see you later. Brian Cashman hosted that press conference without a new deal. So he's not going anywhere. So James click, was definitely not going to come uh, out of Houston and unseat Cashman. But I'll say this. James Click just won a World Series. He was a big part in putting that team together and helping them win the World Series. He wanted an extension. He wanted a longer deal. I think they offered him a one-year deal and uh, I think a raise of not that much money. So he took it as disrespect. That guy seems like he's disgruntled. That guy seems like he's upset at his former employer. <laughs> Why not give him a call? Bring him in. I know there's already assistant GMs to Brian Cashman, but maybe it wouldn't hurt to have another guy with the intel on the team that you need to beat to get back to the World Series. A call doesn't hurt. Maybe they're not able to hire him, but maybe they're able to, you know, have a conversation with him, see where he's at. I, I think it would be great to have him on the baseball operations side uh, somewhere. If he wants to come somewhere um, and maybe be an heir to a, a, a Brian Cashman, right? Maybe he comes in and Brian Cashman's done in four years or five years and he's next in line. Cashman's 55. Click is younger than Cashman. But um, I don't know. I just think that it shows you Jim Crane, the owner of the Astros, how he moves. You know, he probably wants uh, Lou now back. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand that. How do you win a World Series and then tell your GM, ah, we don't really need you? But Brian Cashman is the GM of the New York Yankees. He's pretty much a Steinbrenner. Um, his his contract doesn't matter. I think he po he possibly is the GM for the next 10 years, no matter what the results are, until he wants to retire at 65. And uh, speaking of retiring at 65, I don't know. I hope I can retire at 65. I'm, I'm blessed. That's all I can say. I, I'm, I'm fortunate. Things went my way. And for a long time in my life, they were not going my way. And I kind of had to just trust my instincts. I had to kind of just roll the dice and jump out of the window, literally, and hope that I land on my feet. And I did. It wasn't right away. But, um, you know, for me, I'll say this. I went to school and graduated with a radio and television degree in 2011. Um, I, I think that was a little bit of my safety net. Because there's a ton of people uh, that are creative, that are talented, that are smart, that are knowledgeable, that are putting together great content, great shows, great podcasts, great YouTube videos online, talking about the same thing. There are literally uh, 300 Yankees shows, podcasts that have come up over the last four or five years. For me, um, I was doing social media digital marketing in New York City behind the scenes for MTV, Fubo TV, Rock Nation, like big brands in the city. And when I felt like I learned enough, when I felt like I hit my ceiling in 
that job as a social media manager, I quit. I had a little bit of money saved. I smoked all that money. I drove Lyft, Uber. I worked at a restaurant all while I was building my Instagram and Twitter following, putting out content on YouTube. Um, for people listening to this podcast, if you're familiar with Bronx Pinstripes, I, I started there. I did George's Box in 2018, 2019. I did one season there. I didn't make a dollar from it. Uh, I didn't make any money from Bronx Pinstripes. I did it out of the love of the New York Yankees. And Bronx Pinstripes was a group that existed online early on. Like I invited them to the fan cave with me in 2014. And I did a couple little things for social media leading up to 2018, 2019. Then I did that podcast. And then after that year was done, I was unemployed but I was still making content, putting out tweets, driving Lyft, Uber. I worked at this barbecue restaurant, no restaurant experience, just trying to make a little extra change because my whole goal and vision was, okay, I'm going to get into sports media somehow. I don't know how long it's going to take, but then I linked with John Boy and John Boy was coming to the city. John Boy was launching the Bronx office and I remember I had a job at this place called Spartan Race, which, you know, I mean, it's not a place. It's a big company. But I had a job lined up at Spartan Race to be a senior a senior social media manager there, which would have been away from baseball and sports and what I was trying to do. I accepted that position. They came back to me and said, we can't hire you. The creative agency wants an extra $5,000, $10,000 for signing you. We're sorry, man. So I'm back out on the street. And. I remember that was uh, the same day that I had interviewed and accepted that job. Garrett Cole was announced and Garrett Cole had his press conference. And right after that, I talked to John Boy and I was like, listen, man, I'm unemployed, but I got a lot of talent, a lot of experience. Um, I can help out some way. And I came in as like an intern salary with John Boy, worked my way up to full time. I was one of the first full time employees at John Boy Media. I think I was like six or seven person hired. Now there's like 40, 50 people working at John Boy Media, maybe more by now. I don't I don't exactly know. But then I got on Pinstripe Strong with Joe's McFly. I also was doing talking nets and I was doing social media work behind the scenes, building the foundation for different social channels, YouTube, talking baseball, talking Yanks, uh, John Boy and Jake, radio TV, anything they needed help with. I was um, behind the scenes working there. Two years working for them. Spike Eskin, the new program uh, program manager, the program director at WFAN, was looking for talent. John Boy and Jake came on Moose and Maggie. They took over for a day. Spike keeps looking through the John Boy roster. He finds me. He asked me if I wanted to audition last August 2021. I have a three-hour audition that night. And, uh, you know, a couple months go by. November comes. They announced me as the new full-time nighttime host i'm coming up on a year november 23rd that i've been hosting nights at wfan uh i've put my all into that and a couple months into doing that mlb network comes when enrique and i met at spring training i hadn't made contact with mlb network yet when i got back home from that trip i got an email from mlb network about a new show called off base they had a cast of three they were looking for a fourth I came in and I auditioned during their rehearsals. I got the gig. So then baseball starts this past season. I've got a nightly show on WFAN talking about the Yankees, talking about the Mets, talking about baseball. And then during the day, I'm on off base with a rotating cast of different uh, reporters. X is a former ball player, Xavier Scruggs, LG, who is on MLB Network every day. Hannah Kaiser, who is a reporter for Yahoo. I'm in the mix as a radio host and, uh, Yankees fan and what a, what a season it was the Yankees came up short but man I won uh, I'm blessed to say that my radio and television degree that I graduated with in 2011 it took me 11 years but I'm actually now using my degree uh, on radio and TV but the doors were closed for me coming out of college the doors were closed for me even when I was working in the city but I didn't give up I just kept going and kept working and kept trying different things and networking and pushing and uh, you know, it, it all lined up. So uh, I'm blessed to say that I, I did get to live my dream. I'm living it right now, but 
I had some nightmares to go through to get there. I don't really talk about it too much because being broke and, um, you know, people underestimating you or people telling you you couldn't do it and, and struggling, like, you know, that's not the stuff that people like to hear. But for anybody out there that is struggling, that is going through it, it's not forever. It's temporary. You got to push through. You got to go through it to get to it. That's what I always say. You you got to go through it to get to it. Anything that you want is not a, obtained easily. Anything that you, you know, you see people on TV or on the radio or wherever talking about baseball, they all had some type of work or grind to get there and you got to go through it to get to it. So if you're listening to this and you have a dream, uh, whether it be a podcast or being on TV, or maybe you have a dream to start your own business and open up your own storefront or wherever. Just just keep going, keep pushing, uh, you know, keep God first and and keep your vision first and you'll get there. Talking about you going all in, I got to give you props too on, on going all in on the WFAN. Like you even got into hockey when you're not even a hockey guy. And you, you know, I know you, you've been getting into it with Devils fans lately on the radio. I love it, man. Like you, you gave your all, bro. I, I respect that. Like you gave your all to to everything you've been doing and and nothing but props, nothing but love for you. And like I said in the beginning of the episode, you deserve it, bro. You're you're a good dude. So you deserve everything that's come your way. Um, Alex, do you have a final question for Keith before we let him go? You think I'm gonna ask Keith a question after that freaking speech? Are you nuts? <laughs> like <laughs> that's that's a drop the mic moment. Forget it. Yeah. That's it. Well, <laughs> wrap it up. I, I, what what awesome. I'll say Keith. is, love that I, story, man. <laughs> I don't take it for granted. You know, that's that's why you see me come into WFAN and say, "Hey, I don't watch hockey, but I'm willing to take on a hockey team and learn the game so that my show is open for hockey fans." What if your number one sport is hockey? What if you you know the most about hockey? I don't want you to feel like, oh, Keith McPherson's coming on. He's not going to say anything about the NHL." No, and and I take it for I don't take it for granted. I take it as an opportunity, a blessing, and a rare experience that I get to get on the microphone and, and talk to New York City and beyond with the app. Um, I don't take it for granted. And, and the reason I don't take it for granted is because I'm a fan. And I know how many different radio hosts and TV personalities are, they're popping up every day. There's new people, people on every show. There's new people doing things every day. So I don't sleep. I don't take it for granted. I, I just work and uh, try and make the most of my opportunities, man. I, I know I could be here today, gone tomorrow. We're definitely glad you're here today, man. And we're definitely glad you made the time for us, Keith. Hey, man, thank you so much, man. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening to this, make sure to follow this guy on, on Twitter if you don't already. I'm sure if you're a Yankee fan, you do. But just in the rare occasion that you don't follow him, at Keith McPherson, uh, catch him on uh off base on mlb network every monday tuesday and thursday listen to him nightly on wfan even if you're not in new york get get the odyssey app and listen to him on odyssey like i do you know what i'm saying i live in miami and i listen nightly so no excuses you, no not a problem man hey you deserve it man so and everybody should listen to you so definitely if you're not listening to this man please do and definitely catch him and friend of the podcast Sweeney Murdy on on their podcast BXB it's a great podcast Keith thank you man thank you for your time thanks for the time fellas let's go Yanks hopefully we have a good off season here and uh, I'm rooting for you guys and your show and your podcast keep doing your thing appreciate you man thank you thank you Keith so for Keith McPherson myself and my co-host Alex that will be all for episode 34 of the Hot Esquina podcast. Thank you for listening. Be sure to listen, rate, review, and subscribe. And we'll talk to you next time. Go Yanks.